American Legion Auxiliary's 2016 Washington, D.C. Conference. We are honored to have the Joint Armed Forces Color Guard with us this morning. So I'll ask you to stand while they present colors, and then we will sing our national anthem and conclude by reciting the pledge. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the color guard please retire the colors? Weren't they great? Thank you so much for being with us this morning. <clears throat> National Chaplain Bird Derrick will now offer the invocation. Good morning. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father God, our rejoicing is in you. Thank you, Lord, so much for your faithfulness, for preserving us through the night, for giving us rest, feeding us this morning. God, you are the, the source of our total supply. Lord, your word says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God, we thank you so much that your plan included our being here together today. There is so much for us to learn. And so, Father, I pray for our presenters that they would be clear thinking and give us exactly what you have in your plan and will for us. Lord, there are some in our family today who have really incredible needs. And so I just bring those before your throne of grace and ask that your plan would also be fulfilled in them. Be glorified in our midst today, Lord. We welcome you here. And I pray in the strong name of the one whom I call Savior and Lord. His name is Jesus. Amen.
<coughs> Good morning. Serving as your national president has afforded me the opportunity to meet wonderful members living our mission to serve veterans, military, and their families. I am excited to announce to all of you this morning that the mini council, mini legislative council that we talked about early in the year is complete. Our legislative vice chairman started the ball rolling and it has been completed with the help of the chairman and myself. And we are proud to announce that we now have an auxiliary member connected with every member of the House and Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. The American Legion is very pleased and proud that we have completed this and they look forward to welcoming them also. Boy, that didn't come out well, did it? Early so that they can keep them in the loop of what's happening. I know we have several members of that mini legislative council in the room. Would they please stand because I want us to thank them for coming on board and accepting this awesome responsibility. Thank you. Thank you everyone for accepting that responsibility. That was one thing I'd hoped we could get started and I know that it is going to make a difference in our legislative priorities. I am amazed at everything you do in order to honor the sacrifice of those who served our country and are currently serving our military. My hope is that when you leave today's session with a renewed sense of purpose and new exciting ways to continue engaging in service. Would all the American Legion Auxiliary National Officers please stand to be recognized. And would our mentors and friends, past national presidents, please stand to be recognized. Thank you. This morning we have the privilege of having both our American... Never mind. They didn't tell me that yet, sorry. Just got the message, we're not ready yet. Oh, sorry. She, this little bird's talking to me from behind the curtain. Our first session this morning covers commemorating the 100th anniversary of World War I. I have asked Deborah Noble, our national historian, to facilitate. Deborah? Thank you, Madam President. Good morning, ladies. The history of World War I is also our history. As we approach our centennial, plans are in the works to commemorate the 100th anniversary of World War I as well. Through the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, events are being coordinated across the country and educational materials are being provided to schools and communities. We are joined this morning by Rebecca Wilson. She is the Director of Operations for the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission. Rebecca is an Army veteran with two tours in Iraq, one in the military, and one as a contractor. She was awarded the Bronze Star for her service in Iraq. Rebecca has spent the last seven years volunteering for World War I-related activities and has supported the Centennial Commission for the last year and a half. She was recently brought aboard as a staff member. Please welcome to the stage, Rebecca Wilson. I think it's so important to remember the fir First World War because it shaped the world that we live in now. It wasn't just something that's long gone and buried. The conflicts that emerged, the border disputes that emerged from World War I continued to plague us in very serious ways. World War I is often called the Forgotten War because it was largely overshadowed by World War II. Not only was World War II greater in scope, 
it was also mechanized and it was clear cut. You had the Nazis on one side and you had the perpetrators of Pearl Harbor on the other. Uh, a great crusade with fabulous wonder weapons. You could almost call World War II Lord of the Rings with tanks. Whereas World War I was young men dying in mud in trenches that didn't move. It's not really the stuff of heroic songs. And I think largely uh, the madness of World War I has been overshadowed by the crusade of World War II. It's important to remember it because we went into it grossly unprepared and uh, we repeated the same lesson over again in World War II. The solution to the end of the war was not a solution. And that is the, the lesson we can use to this day. We have to be very careful about how we conduct international relations, especially when it involves armed conflict. Individuals uh, were not only confronted with war, they were confronted with the pandemic flu uh, outbreak. And so many of our young men died of uh, not combat, but of the, the closeness that they had to live and the pandemic that spread. America faced a, a tragedy, but the, the world faced a tragedy in that. The significant loss of life in World War I can be something that we can never forget. World War I is important to remember because it birthed an American century. We hear over and over again about the greatest generation, but who were the parents of the greatest generation? Who forged the greatest generation? It was the World War I veterans, and it was the families of World War I veterans. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the United States World War I Centennial Commission, I'd like to thank the American Legion Auxiliary for this opportunity to share my thoughts and for your time today and for your efforts on behalf of the Centennial Commission in the future. I first want to share with you how I came to be standing in front of you today. Uh, it was about eight years ago, after my second trip to Iraq, as Ms. Noble mentioned, that I moved to the Washington, D.C. area. And I came across the District of Columbia's World War I Memorial, a local memorial to the D.C. residents who served in World War I. And for those of you that live here, you may remember what it looked like back then, but for those that don't, Back then, that memorial was in a heinous state of disrepair. And I thought, well, the sidewalks were broken and cracked. The beautiful marble dome was soiled and blacked from years of neglect. There was litter. It was just a sad, forgotten memorial tucked back in the trees on the National Mall. And that day, I decided that it was time to make a difference there at that memorial. I went home got involved, started organizing cleanups for that memorial, put flags out on that memorial twice a year, 499, one for each of those names that is written on that memorial. But it didn't stop there. I stayed involved, and through the help of many others and a constant pestering of the Park Service, that memorial has now been restored to its original <laughs> status. Thank you. And we didn't stop there. We stayed involved in the World War I community. I still put flags out on the memorial twice a year, but if that memorial in our nation's capital can be forgotten, then maybe there's something bigger there. That war is being forgotten. So I stayed involved, continued to volunteer, and when the commission came along in 2013, I was the first to raise my hand and offer my services, and I have the great pleasure of joining them a year ago as their director of operations. At the World War I Centennial Commission, we have two missions, education and commemoration. Education because too few Americans have knowledge of the Great War and its lasting effects on the 21st century. We still live under the long shadow of the Great War in so many ways. Before the war, the US was an agrarian debtor, debtor nation, a minor power, inward looking, and after the war, the US was a creditor nation, an industrial nation, and the world's leading economic and military power. And Americans now saw themselves, ooh, how do I go back to the beginning? 
and Americans now saw themselves as active participants for the good in world affairs. The service in our armed forces of African Americans, immigrants, women, in the armed forces, in humanitarian services, in industry at home, provided the kindling that sparked the civil rights movement. At the commission, we need help from organizations like the American Legion Auxiliary to tell these stories loudly and proudly. Our country and the world need to hear about the service of over 4.7 million men and women. We need to hear about the 198,000 Texans, the 400,000 New Yorkers, the 200,000 Ohioans, and the 125,000 Californians. In tribal nations across our country, during this war, one in four adult males of service age served in this war. And that's an astounding number. And these are the kind of stories that we need to hear, and these are the kind of stories we need to help the American Legion Auxiliary to tell. Because it's vitally important we understand how this war shaped our nation, and yet too few Americans do. At the World War I Centennial Commission, we aim to fix that. We have an ambitious multi-year program aimed at educating the American public, in particular our youth, about the triumphs and tragedies of this world-changing event. In partnership with the History Channel, the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago, we have outlined a comprehensive education plan that will reach more than 11 million students in middle and high school and broader programs available to the public at large. Our second mission is commemoration. To remember and honor a forgotten generation who will not only served heroically and helped win the war, but came home and became the mothers and the fathers of America's greatest generation. Congress authorized the Centennial Commission to establish a national memorial on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC. The memorial will stand figuratively side by side with the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, and literally alongside the other memorials on the National Mall to the other great wars of the 20th century. And like so many of the recent memorials that pay tribute to our soldiers, we have received no public funds in our authorization. So this memorial project and all of the commission's work will be made possible only through private donations and the assistance and support of organizations like the American Legion Auxiliary. So we need you. We need you now because things are moving quickly. Last year, we announced the design competition for the National World War I Memorial. And we received over 360 submissions from around the world. And then our independent jury narrowed those 360 submissions down to five. They were given time to enhance their designs and give presentations. And the jury came together and unanimously recommended and the commission adopted in an eight to one vote the design, by jo design concept by Joe Weishar and Sabin Howard. So there's a new unique thing about Joe Weishar. Joe Weishar is a 25 year old project architect who just graduated from the University of Arkansas two years ago. Not only does Joe and Sabin's design evoke a powerful memorial to World War I. By choosing a 25-year-old designer, we have opened an opportunity. An opportunity to open a conversation with those 18 to 35-year-olds about the history and tradition of service that we and organizations like the American Legion Auxiliary know too well. Frankly, these days, The membership of our oldest and most prestigious veteran service organizations are aging. Organizations whose members know too well the value of service to this country and paying tribute to those who so selflessly serve. With Joe, we can speak to this generation from a peer. 
not just a peer who was in the same age as them, but if Joe was alive 100 years ago, he would be around the average age of those 4.7 million men and women who wore the uniform. But for Joe to carry this message forward, we must be able to provide him the voice. And we must be, to provide him that voice, we have to carry this memorial project forward. And we can't do that without your help, your donations, and your assistance. Once completed, this memorial will be the largest gesture of appreciation to the American service women and service men and women in a generation. And each of you can be a part of this process. I encourage all of you to go to ww1cc.org slash design, which is written on all of these slides, and check out the design concept and get involved. And don't think this is just some centralized DC operation. We have state chapters popping up all over the country. And if you'd like to be connected to them, go to ww1cc.org and we can connect you to those organizations who are already commemorating World War I in your state. To date, half of the states have committed to commemorating this war. And we need your help to get the other half on board and make sure that this commemoration reaches every community across our great nation you know, after the war, all across this country when the troops returned home and they returned to their hometowns, thousands of local memorials, just like the one I dealt with in DC, were built all over this country. And just like the one I built in DC, they are in varying states of disrepair. At the Centennial Commission, we have not forgotten about these memorials. And raising their profile is as vitally important as build, establishing the National Memorial in Washington, DC. In the near future, the Centennial Commission will announce a small matching grant program to encourage communities to clean up their local World War I memorial. And we encourage all of you that when you go home, you find that forgotten little World War I memorial and see what you can do to pay tribute to those men and women who served from your own local community. And stay tuned and check out the website as more details about this program come to light. The cost of World War I was high. More Americans died in one month of fighting in World War I than the last 14 years we have been fighting the global war on terrorism. But there is a higher cost if we do not pay tribute to these men and women. You know, eight years ago, when I stood in front of that crumbling DC Memorial, I had a clear thought. I thought about my friends, the ones that didn't come home, and the ones that are struggling with the crippling PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And you know, we say to them, we are going to remember and honor the sacrifices that you and your family are making for this country. But how can I be honest in telling them that? When here I am, in front of this DC World War I Memorial, and it hasn't been 100 years, and we forgot, and we forgot a long time ago. We forgot about the service of 4.7 million men and women, the 116,516 that gave their lives. How can we turn to a young person who is thinking of joining the military today and be honest in telling them that their service will be remembered? So we need you. We need you to sign up. We need you to show up and make sure that the service of almost 5 million Americans receives the honor, respect, and attention it deserves. If we come together and can coordinate a sustained national tribute to those who served in World War I, we can then turn to that young person thinking of enlisting today <clears throat> and be honest in telling them that their service mattered and will always be remembered. On the eve of the centennial, we must embrace this moment to recognize the World War I generation. We, today, all of us, can build their legacy and install them in a place of honor alongside the other millions who served in the 20th century's other great conflicts. It is our task to ensure they are not forgotten. It is our mission to provide a voice to these Americans who can no longer speak 
But by doing so, we send a powerful message to those veterans who are still with us today, that 50, 75, and 100 years from now, their service too will never be forgotten. And on behalf of the World War I Centennial Commission, I would like to thank you for attendance here today, and I hope you all get involved to pay tribute to these 4.7 million men and women who wore the uniform in World War I. I don't know how I am with time, if there's time for questions. A couple questions. Are there any questions? No questions? This is the tall and short of it, that's for sure. <laughs> if you do have any questions, please go to the microphone in the middle. Hi, Carol Harlow from here in the DC office for the American Legion Auxiliary. Rebecca, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I thought I'd start out our questions. Um, are there specific ways that we can honor our family members or our family members' friends who had served in World War I at the memorial? Um, at the memorial itself, the DC does not allow you to push pl place pavers, but we will have an online exhibit for for those who want to make a donation on behalf of someone. And we also have, as part of our social media project, you can submit a story of service about your family member that will be posted on our Facebook page and shared, and it's usually shared throughout the country. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right, thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Rebecca. Your team is doing great work as we approach the centennial. We appreciate you being with us this morning and look forward to working with you and the Legion for this monumental occasion. Please join me in giving her a round of applause. Doesn't that memorial design look great? As Rebecca mentioned, there are several ways we can help prompt the work of the Commission as we also remember World War I. First, we can help commemorate the service of Doughboys by submitting their stories or an artifact. Between our members, not just our historians and local classrooms and organizations we work with, let's come together to record these stories and submit them to the Commission. As we think about our own centennial, can your units and departments incorporate remembering World War I? Search the events calendar to see if there's an event near you that you could attend. If you are hosting a public event, you can submit it to, submit it to appear on the calendar. Finally, the Commission offers some great educational resources. For those of you working with your local schools, make sure that teachers know these tools are out there. Tips for all of this can be found on the Commission's website. That's www.worldwar1centennial.org. The Legion has a representative on the Commission, so please keep your eyes open for information that may come out through the magazine, e-news, and communications from the History Committee or the Historian. And who can forget that moving monument design we saw? Wow. Are you as excited as I am to travel back to DC and see it being built and visiting it when it's finished? I certainly am. Thank you, Madam President. The American Legion Auxiliary is fortunate to work with great companies, like USAA, who understand who we are and believe in what we do. And don't we love the ALA poppy bag, USAA ALA poppy bag? 
It's my pleasure to bring to the stage Chris Figueroa with USAA. Please welcome Chris. Here the bags. <laughs> the bag. <laughs> wow, it's bright. I want a sec. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Chris Figueroa, and I'm your rep one of your representatives here uh, today who came to DC. And I'm part of a two member team back at S San Antonio for you guys. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be here. So, as you can tell, I was military, served 12 years, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, both, and uh, wife, two kids, been married 13 years. And my job is to know as much as possible about you all so that I can represent you back at USAA. Um, like I said, I have two kids. And one of the biggest things I always get on questions is eligibility. Now, when my eight-year-old was born, I was gone because of the military. And my wife constantly reminds me about that all the time. <laughs> and yeah, especially when I'm in trouble. But I was gone, but something I really wanted to do was do something positively. So I, I did call USA and give them a member number. So a question I received is, how is eligibility done? Well, once you establish eligibility, you get your first insurance product, and usually it's that person's military, you can pass it down to your kids. And once they buy their first insurance product, they can pass it down to their kids, okay? Because I'm eligible, I can't pass it to my sister or brother. I can't pass it up to my parents, but if you have any questions and you think you may be eligible, you have a dedicated number, and you can stop by and get the number from me, or I can just give it to you now. It's 855-291-8252, uh, and I'll say that again, 855-291-8252, and they can tell you what products and services you're eligible for, <clears throat> and there's other ways to get eligibility. For example, I said, my mom, she wasn't eligible through me, but her father was a Korean War veteran, and he was still around, he's still around today. So they conference called USAA together, bought him a insurance policy to pay for a piano he had in his house for like $7, I think every six months or something like that, and then she got an insurance policy, and she's now a member. And then when she became a member, she called my sister and said, hey, we can become members now. So there's different techniques. Stop by, give us a call. We'd love to help you out. Something everybody is eligible for is the auxiliary credit card here. All right. It's a pretty card here. The catch is, in order to apply for this card, you have to use that dedicated phone number I gave you. If you call in, you just Google USA and use our regular line, guess what? You're not going to be able to get it. This is like a backdoor way to get the card. It's a special way. It's a special way. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. It's a special way. It really is, because everybody else is not eligible for the bank products except you, you ladies, you guys. Um, now, we do have some changes coming to the card. Uh, starting June, July of this year, uh, we're switching, USA as a whole is switching from MasterCard uh, to Visa. And it was a business decision. It's, it's going to be good for us. Your card is still going to have the same benefits you have now with some added ones. Okay. Um, now, if you have an American Express, your card is going to stay the same. You won't get a new card. But you're going to, nothing you have to do at all. You're going to receive a letter in the mail. It's going to say this is your new card. It's going to look exactly like the same card. But instead of having a MasterCard, it's going to have a Visa. And once you activate your Visa, your MasterCard's dead, and you got a Visa card. Another change we're going to have is a chip and pin card. So if you guys have gone to Canada or Europe, you've probably gone to a restaurant, and everybody's putting their card into a machine and then putting the pin number. That's the way the United States is moving to. And the reason why is because of legislation. So right now, if someone steals my wallet and they have my card, my credit card, and they go to Red Lobster, and it, I just have a, reg, a regular magnetic strip. If someone goes to Red Lobster and they steal my card and they use it, right now the banks are responsible. 
So USA, you're going to get your money back, but USA has to reimburse that money for credit fraud. Once we get these chip and pins in all the cards, Red Lobster would be the person who would have to pay back the, the, the fraudulent charges. So because of that, you're going to see all the industry move to these chips inside the cards, and it's going to be a lot more secure for the users. All right. Now I have the bag. Almost done here. So everybody loves these bags. All right. In fact, I got five of them with me today because I know you guys are going to ask for questions. I have five. The first five you see me at my booth, you can have them. <laughs> One each. <laughs> All right. So there's a competition that we started this year. And the department with the largest percent increase in membership will get the bags. First place will get 500 bags and $500. Second place will get $300 and 300 bags. And third place will get $200 and 200 bags. So the way we're doing it is for September 1st, 2015, we had your da data. And then in August 1st, 2016, coming up, who has, whoever has the biggest annual increase will get the uh, top three awards. All right. Well, guys, thank you very much for allowing me to speak here. It was an honor. If you have any questions, I'll be at my table over here till 3 o'clock today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. The American Legion Auxiliary members exemplify service, not self, through countless volunteer hours, programs, conferences, and an increased presence in Washington, D.C. Although things have changed since the Auxiliary's establishment, one thing remains the same, our unwavering commitment to honor those who serve. Let's take a look at this enlightening video to learn more about the American Legion Auxiliary history and why now is an exciting time to be part of the world's largest patriotic service organization. Decades of making a difference. For nearly 100 years, we've been working together with the American Legion to serve veterans, active military, and their families. We're truly a fascinating story. Looking back, the clothes, the hairstyles, the cars we drove may look different, but there is one thing